Hi everybody, my name is Andrew Dalton from the Adams County Historical Society. Uh, I want to talk about one of the most famous, if not the most famous, civilian associated with the Battle of Gettysburg. And that is the gentleman behind me. This is John L. Burns. Some of you may know him as the hero of Gettysburg. He's a 69-year-old citizen of the town that ended up joining the ranks out here with the 150th Pennsylvania and then going into the woods and fighting with Wisconsin men from the Iron Brigade. John Burns, on the morning of July 1st, got up, left his house, argued with his neighbors, uh, accused them of being cowards and not joining the Union Army alongside him. Um, he's a veteran of the, the eight, War of 1812. Um, he comes out to the field, um, and it, it, really the soldiers that see him, they start laughing. They, they think it's really funny. Uh, but they actually send him to the woods behind me so that he's a little bit safer. Um, but it may have been a mistake for Burns because some of the harshest fighting on July 1st happened in the woodlot behind me, Herbst Woods. Um, Burns, during the retreat, after fighting the Confederates, supposedly killing a couple of them, um, he retreats with the Union Army and he's wounded at least three times during the course of this gradual uh, push, pushing back of the Union forces towards Seminary Ridge. Um, Burns is left on the field and on the evening of July 1st um, and into the morning of July 2nd, he crawls to the edge of town. Um, to the uh, home of an, a friend of his, Alexander Riggs. He crawls up onto the cellar door, and that's where he's discovered the next day and taken by wagon back to his home. When he got home, his wife said, I thought I told him not to go out and do that. Uh, so there's this incredible civilian uh, encounter here with uh, men of the Bucktail Brigade, the Iron Brigade. Burns is a legend. This monument was put up in the early 1900s to commemorate um, his service. But there's also a few other uh, uh, locals who end up serving. Uh, there's an African-American, supposedly, who joins the ranks on Culp's Hill. Um, and there's also, we don't know his name, unfortunately. Uh, but there are also some, uh, some local, there's a college student who's wounded uh, in the fighting. Uh, so it's important to remember that the civilians had an active role uh, in the battle, not just as, uh, as nurses and doctors taking care of the wounded, but also um, in combat. And Burns' story is a great example example of that. And that's great. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, you know, it's it's incredible. He becomes one of the most famous people in America in his time. He makes the cover of Harper's Weekly, for which there is no equivalent anymore. It used to, used to be the cover of Time Magazine, but I'm not going to go too much more into Burns just to say that Lincoln wanted to meet him and did when he came to deliver his Gettysburg Address. I want to point out one thing about the monument for you nerds out there, that the number of buttons on his vest does not match the number of buttons on uh, buttonholes on his vest. So, Or maybe it's his coat. You all can come out and figure that out. Now, this monument and Gettysburg battlefield monuments are meant usually to denote a place where something happened, but you also wanted it along a road. And it's important to note that this road actually used to go straight through here. So if this, if it was put up at the time, this would have been in the middle of the road, but it wasn't. Chris, come on over here. What we know is that, you know, a good quarter of Gettysburg monuments have been moved, moved for one reason or another. Um, and excuse my lack of grace here uh, in advance, but here we have Burns's monument, but the monument actually used to sit because this is where the road was. It was right here. And I am standing on the old stone base, actually, of the John Burns Monument. It's exactly the size of that boulder. And they just moved the whole boulder when they curved the road. Why did they curve the road? Well, because uh, there was a hairpin turn. And when cars went like eight miles an hour, it was no big deal. Then they started going 20 and 30. And they had to smooth out all the curves. So they pushed John Burns forward. Now, we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over. But real quick, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. Share this with your friends so that more people can participate in this Gettysburg 157 commemoration. Thanks, Gary. Uh, behind me is the farm of Congressman Edward McPherson. Um, it was occupied at the time of the battle by the family of John Slentz. Uh, John's wife um, was uh, there with their at least four or five children on the morning of July 1st. She was actually uh, five months pregnant at the time as well. Um, and, and she wrote much later, uh, instantly all was confusion and before a moment had passed, myself and five children driving our cows before us were fleeing towards the town of Gettysburg. All we saved was the clothing we were attired in at the time and if I remember rightly, the children were bareheaded and without shoes or stockings. Um, and they ended up going to the cellar of the Lutheran Seminary uh, building, Old Dorm, uh, where they would stay uh, and, and help care for the wounded over the, the weeks uh, after that. So uh, the family flees, much like some of the other families in this area. Some go to their cellars and hide. The Slentz family actually leaves. Um, and it's a good thing they did because the barn and house, the house is no longer standing, but the barn uh, becomes... Uh, a centerpiece for the Union line on McPherson's Ridge on July 1st. And in fact, there are Union soldiers that go into the barn and are shooting out of all the, the, uh, the spaces between the rocks, um, the, the doors and the windows. Um, 
and it becomes almost like a castle. Uh, and so on the afternoon of July 1st, when the Confederate advance comes up to the barn, uh, we have these really fascinating accounts of, of what took place. This is a, a Colonel uh, William Christian of the 55th Virginia, um, and he wrote, Pressing the enemy back foot by foot, we swept by a large barn in which many of the Yankees took refuge. After passing the barn, they fired from the windows and other openings into the backs of our men. Lieutenant Lawson of the 55th Virginia was ordered to take two companies and attack the barn. An officer standing in the door of the barn, ordered uh, by Major Lawson to surrender, refused and fired point blank into Lawson's face. He missed him and shot an officer just behind him. The federal officer was immediately killed by one of my men, Sergeant Allen, who brought to me his sword and pistol. So you've got this really personal, ugly encounter um, right in the, uh, in the bay of the McPherson barn behind me, or McPherson, I should say. Uh, there's no fear in a McPherson. Um, and uh, so it's stories like this. You have the civilian aspect, but then also uh, these farms turning into killing fields and uh, later hospitals. This was a massive field hospital, especially for wounded Union soldiers left on the first day's field. Good, good. Well, thanks, Andrew. This is just one part of the Gettysburg battlefield that we're checking out right now. We've already been out to this first shot marker. Uh, we shot a video that we might post soon um, uh, or already have maybe uh, at Reynolds uh, and Buford's statue. We've been live inside uh, McPherson's Woods down near uh, uh, Willoughby's Run. Uh, we filmed about the pond. We've got this covered. We have a lot more to come on Facebook and YouTube. Join us July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, and even beyond as we clean up all these videos. Hit us with your questions, share it with your friends, and thanks for supporting Battlefield Preservation.